So this is our first attempt at doing a podcast. Uh, we've decided that we're going to give it a go. Uh, everyone's been requesting it. So here we go. I'm with um, Dr. Tran and Deviant. Hello, everyone. How's it going? What topic are we starting with today? I personally want to know why the hell you started this. I mean, you said people have been asking for it, but people ask for a lot of dumb shit. And I don't listen to people most of the time. That's what got me to where I am in life. So what made you want to listen to the public? <laughs> so I've kind of, I've been toying with the idea of doing this for a while. We've done some podcast adjacent stuff through our PUBG streams where we talk tech while we play games and people seem to like it. So I figured, hey, why not, uh, why not have a go with a real podcast and see what people think? Yeah, we weren't even going that technical. It was very high level topics. I mean, mostly we were distracted about because we were being shot at and stuff like that. And I remember one time, uh, there's, I think there's a clip somewhere online where tech was uh, hiding behind a car and then someone throws a grenade and blows them up while we're trying to talk. So that was, uh, that was kind of funny. Excellent. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I guess, what, what, I mean, Dee, what, what have you been up to up in uh, Seattle? Hopefully things are safe, and it sounds like you guys are going out and at least trying to enjoy the outdoors a little bit. Yeah, we were out in the boat today. We have, um, we have a little inflatable kayak, so we go out, we, we fish, we, like, drop, you know, shrimp traps and other things. And uh, my, my ideal, like, this is, this is just, I'll go out in the boat, and my ideal fishing trip would be I don't even cast a line, let alone catch anything. Tara keeps apologizing that we don't usually catch things. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. This is enhancing my enjoyment of this experience. It's less work. <laughs> to me, fishing is just eat a sandwich in a boat. Yes. I've always been a little bit cautious of those inflatable kayaks because they catch the wind and I'm just terrified. I'm just going to get blown away. <laughs> Fortunately, we haven't blown off yet. Yeah. I can't cool. swim, so I stay out of the water unless uh, it's a more stable uh, vessel that I can sit in. <laughs> I will say I'm perplexed at the number of people that I see on paddle boards. I cannot imagine a less enjoyable form of water-based recreation. Yeah, I've never really understood them because like I surf and you see them a lot in the lineup, but they're just so yeah. heavy and so hard to steer. It's yeah. like essentially just standing on a shitty boat. Right. You can't sit down. You can't relax. Yeah. But it's not like surfing where the water carries you forward. Like you have to do all the work and no rest and you probably can't drink while you're doing it too much. So I just not think it makes sense to me. Yeah, they they're very hard to balance on. I can't I I can't imagine it being fun, but I guess people like it. It maybe it's it's exercise, I guess. Yeah, I, I hear it's a real like core body workout and ab workout. Um it definitely requires balance as well. So definitely drinking is probably not an activity you should be partaking in. Um I mean, speaking of drinking, I mean, Tech, I noticed you have a, a bottle behind you. I mean, what are you uh, sipping on right now? So I have my um, a Nagori, which I got for my birthday. It's uh, It's been in here in the fridge for uh, pretty much a month now, and it's still tasting pretty good. Okay, nice. Okay, nice. Deep, I, I Deep, noticed you had a glass, as, had well. A glass as well. I've just been topping up a bourbon for a while. For a while. Okay, so you're pretty toasted already then. <laughs> well, just during the sound check. <laughs> Yeah, I'm having a bottle of uh, Tatori 27. So I whipped out the big guns for uh, for today. Nice. So which uh, which infosec topic are we starting with today? Let's see. Is there anything in the news that's been like the what is the the latest well, signal? Signal's big. There's something big on Signal that that came out. There's a lot of. Oh like, yeah, the the pin number that everyone's been getting annoyances about mm -hmm. recently. Yeah, apparently yeah. that's going to be tied. Now, this is uh, getting above my pay grade. Have you either re have you read the reports like it's they're going to use that pin as a way to secure certain user data in a bucket, you know, online. I don't know what data, but anytime the data is being stored not on your device, people are like, "Eek." Uh I think it's mostly relating to making your contacts more portable. Mm -hmm. And because they immediately got a huge outcry, it's already been reported, I believe, that they, they said they're making it optional for advanced users. Yeah, I believe it is for contacts because they want to move to the model where you don't need to give out your phone number. You can create a user account, basically, and your contacts doesn't have to be tied to your local device. It's, it's to your account, so to speak. So, yeah, I think that's kind of what their explanation has been. But I guess my the, the thing I'm curious about is they announced this 
optionality of this feature after all the outcry. Mm -hmm. Not at the same time or not before. They basically released the pin feature. Then later on, they introduced this optionality to the beta version for people to test after all the outcry. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, so it seems kind of like they're trying to move to more of a like a Skypey type model where they are a service that runs on, uh, I don't know if it's SMS or uh, if it's over data, but they want to be kind of an abstraction layer on top of your phone rather than relying on kind of the carrier, which I, I do like. I did notice that um, my phone number changed and my signal number is still my old number, but people are yeah. still able to contact me. And uh, I was told that was something to do with the pin as well, which I guess I set up at some point. So I did notice that my uh, my signal account is now portable between devices, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the I mean, I, I think the direction they're going is is not necessarily bad, um, because I think what they're trying to do is make it more convenient. And when apps are more convenient, you're going to get a larger user base. And I think that's the right thing to do, the right direction um, as, as like a product, as, as a business. So I don't fault them for that. Um, I, I think they pro maybe should have anticipated the outcry and maybe have done some better communications and change management early on to say, hey, this is coming to kind of solicit feedback and discussion before just rolling it out. I imagine it's quite tricky to be kind of to have signals business model where you are you are kind of. Uh you're advertising to a very, very niche crowd of people who are, who care a lot about privacy, which surprisingly is not a lot of people. And then you, you, in order to get the wider user base and the kind of more general public, you have to start adding features that outrage your kind of core privacy base. So I imagine it's kind of a, a difficult position to be in of trying to expand your platform while not angering the people that it was targeted at. It's interesting to me that we talk about business models and expanding a platform for a free product, though. Uh, not like most free products where you are the, the product, like, you know, your data. They're not doing anything with our data. So it's strange to me that they would, A, do anything to artificially broaden the base because that just costs them more, I guess, what, donation dollars? I don't actually know how they pay for their cloud. Yeah, I don't even know what their business model is. I mean, yeah, so... I yeah, like I assume it's not a non-profit. I, my assumption is they are making money somehow, but I've never really looked into it. I don't know if they are. I don't, I don't have any idea. Yeah, we're a bunch of assholes right now talking about stuff we don't understand, I guess, maybe. <laughs> Isn't that just I podcasting mean, 101? Yeah, it's pretty much we're nailing it <laughs> right out of the gate, like perfect. Uh, but like, think of like a product everyone uses, like a web browser. I recognize that my usage of the web browser is unconventional, which is... I run all my browsers all the time, saving nothing. So the moment I close my web browser, I am logged out of everything. I'm always constantly re-logging into shit. It makes me remember all my passwords, like some magic trick, but that's not the normal use case, but it exists in every web browser. The idea of delete all data when you close the browser. Um, so I feel like if regular ass web browsers can understand that some users are okay, with the inconvenience of data loss if they close it. I feel like an app like Signal, it makes sense that there should be some configuration, which basically means no storage of anything. I just wanna be, if I wanna talk to you again, like I'll just remember your number and type it in manually and start a new conversation on a new phone. Hey, you wanna be almost like a dumb endpoint or a dumb terminal. That's what I would like, but I'm rare. I mean, I, I think they have that by default. They just kind of overlooked uh, they overlooked that case when they made this feature mandatory and then had to go back and say, "We're sorry, guys. We're we're gonna just we're just gonna have it as an optional feature." Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, I think you know we'll we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, I'm personally a user of Signal. I know many people who use it, including non-tech people, actually. So. I think this idea of privacy, and maybe it's because of my social circles, but at least even non-tech people, the idea of privacy is becoming more and more important. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it is a good thing that they're trying to broaden their user base and make it more appealing to, to the broader um, you know, consumer base. I, I think that's, a, that's only a positive. My point, my do you know point. anyone who uses Wire? Um, I do, actually. I don't know why. I just have this one contact who insists on using Wire. And then it's like, what's yeah. wrong with Signal? And they're like, no, yeah. wire, wire only. 
I, well, I remember when Wire came out and everyone for like a week was like, yeah, try Wire. And I was like, <laughs> fuck no. And then like no one talked about it ever again, except apparently your one friend. Yeah, so I, I feel like is it's a very different use case for Signal. The kind of use case I see it most used for is more of a collaboration environment. So less of a, of a, of a Signal and more of a Slack kind of thing. Yeah. And it's like Slack, but without the storing everyone's data in the cloud. Mm -hmm. but uh i i didn't really get it like i i don't know why i need to do that like if i'm collaborating what we're collaborating on is not likely to be so sensitive that i need it to be done via signal yeah i know some groups that use keybase almost exclusively now too which I is like keybase it is the most unusable <laughs> interface i've ever ever seen it's just nothing is intuitive. I tried to use it to kind of as a way to host my public key so that people could privately message me with just email. And it was just the most unintuitive interface I could possibly imagine. Yeah, I don't know what it's for. I know some like weird, obscure Facebook groups. I'm not on Facebook, but like, it's like a bunch of gun groups that are like, I won't talk about this on Facebook, but hit me up on Keybase. I, I guess it's being used by some of the less technical crowd as like, and basically uh, a makeshift signal kind of. Kind of. But how untechnical do you need to be for signal to be a high bar? I have no Signal's idea. an SMS <laughs> like, it's core. Like, oh man. I mean, I, I know some people, yeah, they, they won't talk about gun related stuff, even on like iMessage. They're that paranoid. I mean, okay, whatever. Uh, I guess I, I kind of understand that. Um, I personally, like, I, I really, there's very few things I care about so much that I will not talk about it outside of Signal. Mostly I just use Signal as a convenience because everyone in tech insists on messaging yeah. me that way. Yeah. And it's more reliable. Like if I'm on a plane, you know, you can't text text because you're not on a cell network. If you're yeah, in a, yeah, if, you're yeah. in, if you're in a building where there's no cell service, but Signal works because you're on the Wi-Fi. Yeah, I do find it's definitely a lot more consistent than really any other phone services I've used. I mean, one thing that um, I wish Signal had was being able to have have it on more than one mobile device, because I have several mobile devices and just the convenience of that. But I appreciate that. that I believe you can. I've, I've at least linked it to my mobile and my desktop. So I assume if I can have it on my desktop and my uh, mobile, I could have it on separate mobile devices. No, I, I think there's a bunch of FAQs on that topic. You can have one mobile device and then your desktop, but you can't have multiple mobile devices. Ah, interesting. That seems like a very strange limitation to have. That is weird. Yeah, I think there was there was a beta for iOS at one point where you could potentially link it to, to multiple mobile devices, but I never got it working. So uh, I just I just kind of gave up. So I just need to make sure I don't lose my primary phone. I won't be able to contact uh, my my tech co contacts. Yeah, I, I actually managed to lose not only my contact list but my entire phone number, which was was not not great. Well, everyone I know uses myself included uses their signal tied to a Google Voice number, which makes it relatively portable phone to phone. Yeah, I'm always worried about using Google Voice because I feel like my phone is less likely to get hacked than my Google account. But maybe yeah. that's just me. You got to have a secondary Google account. Google yeah, account exactly. tied to some bullshit ID that no one ever has heard of. Yeah. That, that, that's what I do as well. I, it, it just helps uh, have, a, have a backup to be able to get into things and mm -hmm. if I need to. And then, I mean, all of my stuff is spread out pretty evenly across the ecosystem between Google, between Apple. I even have Microsoft stuff as well. So, um, yeah, I, I try to. Try to Hiding a Windows stuff. phone somewhere over there. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I had the I had the BlackBerry tablet. Well, what did they call it? The the Play something. Um, uh, that was that was years ago. That that was a like seven inch tablet. The the landscape tablet. Mm -hmm. um, the hardware was kind of cool, but the software was complete garbage. And. And I remember when when BlackBerry was was pitching it, they were talking about how this is the ultimate enterprise device and everything. And I remember one of our, our architects on the team raised his hand, like, "Wait, if this is an enterprise and work product, why is it called the BlackBerry? I think it's called the Playbook." And they had no answer for it. Like, what? Is yeah, I feel like BlackBerry was like such a big thing. Everyone was like, "I'll, I'll BBM you." 
Um, and everyone I remember that, phones, yeah. and then just one year it was just gone, and like no one, no one bought these or used them anymore. Well, I, I think that people who hung on to BlackBerry, they were stuck on the the physical keyboard uh, because back back then the uh, the, the, the touchscreen um, keyboards were not as good. Uh, the error recognition was not as good, so you had a lot of typos. Um, and I mean, I held on to a physical keyboard for a long time as well. I mean, my favorite phone was um, my Sony Ericsson M600i that oh, had a touchscreen, a stylus, and a keyboard. It was amazing. Um, and I held on to that for a very long time. Well, I remember most of the like long-term BlackBerry users that I knew late in its ecosystem they liked it because Bez, the BlackBerry Enterprise service, was really secure even overseas. And then if I recall, RIM started caving to a lot of shitty governments. Yep. And like so in the kingdom and Saudi Arabia, it, they, they just wanted more market area, which is funny because like they were losing market share because they were outdated. So they needed new markets. So they started caving to crappy regimes in the hopes of opening markets and it just made everyone leave them faster. Yeah, that was yeah. what I heard is they had kind of marketed themselves as the only non-decryptable like messaging service. Yeah. And then some com some co uh, country was like, we want to be able to decrypt this and like, here's how you do it. And it's yeah. like, wait a second, you said you weren't decryptable, but you've just given the keys to Saudi Arabia. So mm -hmm. like, are you decryptable or not? Exactly. Yeah, and I think they were relying on their 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 footprint in the enterprise, thinking, hey, we don't have to worry, we don't have to innovate because we have the enterprise. And I think what happened around this time as well was all the Androids and iOS devices started to get cheaper and more accessible. And people were using it personally, and there was innovation there, and people liked it more. And people were just trying to find ways of using these consumer devices for enterprise uses, and it just started eroding BlackBerry faster and faster. Eventually, just found themselves dead in the water. That the only people who stuck with them were the ones who wanted the physical keyboards, and then all the the glass keyboards, uh, the screen keyboards, caught up with the error correction, and then that just that was like the last nail in the coffin. I think. What's the next technology that's going to be like gone in the blink of an eye in corporate land? Oh man, that's a hard question. Oh, I, I don't know. Is there going to be something related to remote access because we're all quarantined and stuff? Is there something like work from home that's going to that's going to absolutely change? Or has there been? I, honestly, like we're talking on Zoom right now. Yeah, I think the change was the other way. It was the yeah. the lockdown. It's uh, obviously it made Zoom a big thing. Like that was fairly unheard of before COVID, and it became this household name. Mm -hmm. um, I I find myself saying uh, like even if it's not on Zoom, I'm like, hey, do you want a Zoom? Even yeah. if we're like talking on <laughs> fucking FaceTime or something. Yeah. And uh, it's just become this big household name. And uh, companies are kind of now building out the infrastructure to have remote work. Whereas in the past, it was like, oh, no, no, re remote work isn't possible. You you can't possibly work from your house. Like, how would that even work? Like, how would you how would you collaborate? And then within like a week of COVID, it was like, OK, we've built all of these softwares. We've got collaboration down. We've got uh, conferencing down. And uh, I, I just kind of think that the kind of the real innovation was all of the stuff we've made during COVID, or not mm -hmm. necessarily made, but kind of focused on that I think will stay around when it's gone. Companies will maybe start realizing, hey, it's actually cheaper to not have office space in Austin or LA or Seattle. Why don't we just have more remote employees? And I honestly think that we will see kind of more remote jobs in uh, like, this kind of post COVID era. Does anyone else have a story like this right as zoom was exploding because, you know, lockdown, I knew a school teacher, she got in touch with me and this was right when zoom bombing was awful and zoom actually quickly, like, like let's make passwords way easier to use on meetings and stuff. So I think zoom qu corrected it very quickly, but she was giving it a, given a directive by her school. And it was like, find any solution other than Zoom. And she's asking me, she's like, what do people use that's not Zoom? I'm like, why the fuck would you use anything that isn't Zoom? Like, she's like, oh, we literally, the school board has a directive that says Zoom is the most vulnerable product. We can't use it. I'm like, oh my God, that was, this news is like four days old. What's wrong with your school board? I mean, it, is, so, yeah. it, is, it is really good that Zoom has reacted very quickly 
I, I mean, I, I know that they stood up like a, a security uh, advisory board or council, I think, where they pulled in CISOs from other large organizations to help advise and, and help steer uh, and actually provide input as well on what their concerns are. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think they've been very proactive. And I think recently in the news, they, they hired a new CISO as well. To really- yeah, I believe it was the uh, Alex. Uh, it was a it was a CISO from Salesforce, I want to say. I thought it was the ex Facebook CISO. Yeah, wasn't it Stamos who got hired, or was that not? Was he not CISO? I don't know. I know I someone needs to pull up a smartphone now and look it up. <laughs> yeah, I believe they that Stamos was brought on in in some capacity. I have to check it quickly, but I'm I'm pretty sure that is. He was checking right now. We'll we'll see who's right or okay. wrong. Stamos Zoom, Alex uh, St- Zoom advisor. He's a quote an advisor. So oh okay, so he's not he's not CISO. And it's funny if you Google Stamos and Zoom, the second story is about him weighing in on Keybase. <laughs> <laughs> well, they they bought it, didn't they? And they and everyone was like, "Oh, we can't use Keybase." Oh, that's, now. yeah, it's, right, it's right. Dead. Yeah, uh, back to your uh, your first point is I did have problems with the same thing. I had all these people contact me. They're like, "Hey, Malware Tech, like, what what uh, software do you suggest we use for our school, our work, whatever?" And they had. I don't know what exactly happened, but I think after the Zoom bombing, there was such a big backlash mm-hmm. that they just, they weren't like, this is a password issue. People are not putting passwords on their meetings. Therefore, anyone can join. They were like, this is a Zoom problem. Right. And then Which even once Zoom had fixed, like they had made passwords mandatory, everyone was just like, this is a Zoom problem. Zoom is insecure. We can't use Zoom. And of course, there was absolutely no problem with the platform. Right. Uh, it was probably one of the better, most, like it was by far the easiest to use uh, kind of teleconferencing platform. Mm-hmm. And suddenly everyone is moving away from it over this kind of, this hysteria over something that is no longer even uh, an issue. Yeah. Uh, my glass is a little empty, so I'm going to pretend to have a connection issue for a second. <laughs> <laughs> so, so speaking of like enter- changes in enterprise, and now that you know, we've all reloaded on, on our drink, we can continue to talk about, I guess, the enterprise world. <laughs> I mean, I think another fundamental change coming out of this uh, pandemic is probably network architecture. The traditional network architecture, you know, the hub and spoke where those office spaces, it, it really is going to change. Um, and I think companies are going to start moving into this model where office spaces are basically just high Wi-Fi hotspots. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there's really no more security needed. It's going to be treated as an unsecure hotspot area. And all your security is done through the application layer or the connection that the machine does to, has with your applications, et cetera. So I think there's potentially going to be that shift, especially for the larger enterprises, as there is reduction in real estate and in, in, in shifts in how people work. So that's at least from my point of view where network architecture is going to go and potentially application architectures as well. Absolutely. I definitely like I've seen a lot of that kind of shift already is the moving to like the zero trust model where it's like. Just anyone can bring their device onto the network and we don't necessarily need to trust that it's not running malware because all of our security is in the application and we don't have to kind of worry about what is running or isn't running on the device. Um, our, our company actually uses that. We have, a, we have um, a physical auth token. So even if the device is running malware, there is no way to get into the account without the physical tokens. And a big thing that started the very start of the cracks in, in that that killed it was um, back to BlackBerry. Everyone said these are dumb and busted. I have an iPhone. I feel I let me use my damn iPhone on the corporate network. Yeah, and I. Oh, go ahead. I go on. No, I was just saying. I mean, that, that's that's like a good example of uh, you know what happened recently. You hear about with Amazon and TikTok, mm-hmm. where their people are using their, their personal devices to, for work purposes but installing other applications. And then Amazon sends out a position that, hey, you must uninstall TikTok. And then later in the day, like, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think you're going to continue to see this convergence of devices where people use them for both personal use and enterprise use. And how do you balance that, um, you know, the security with pe- what people want to do in the convenience of, of personal use? Uh, I'm uh, I'm just hoping kind of the the momentum doesn't stop too soon because obviously uh, coronavirus is it's going to go away at some point no idea when 
but I'm hoping that we've kind of built enough progress into this, like this shift towards remote work that in the kind of post COVID area, we will just, companies will be open to that kind of, that, that idea. Yeah. I was just talking with Tara about this, that the idea that even once it's managed and even if there's a vaccine, I bet America is bad enough at healthcare that it won't be fully stamped out like polio or something. And that people will much more than we've ever seen in the past say for medical reasons, like I'm opting out of coming into the office. And you're going to just start seeing that in so many job interviews, even people who like could be okay in the office, they're just going to start saying it because everyone, you know, Hey, this is an excuse. I hate going to the office. F you. And it's just going to be a thing that everyone learns to accept. Companies learn to accept remote work. I can, I can definitely see that happening. And uh, I feel like it's better for the companies anyway, because they're not paying as much for office yeah. real estate. They're not paying as much overhead for in-house IT management and uh, accounting, just everything that you need to kind of kind of deal with for the office. Like we don't have to do office expenses. You can just kind of let the employees go on with their day, do their own thing. Yeah. And that's like a, a massive deduction in overhead. And the only reason they haven't already seen that as the path forwards is everyone had this idea of it's not possible. Like we can't possibly be a functional company remotely. And then everyone realized that in the midst of this horrible pandemic, when everyone is just kind of scared out of their minds, it still works. Yeah. I, I think the effects, the negative effects, we may not see for a little bit of time. Um, it'll be a very interesting kind of management study or scientific study looking at corporate uh, productivity. Because even though a lot of, especially the work that you know we, we all do here, um, I, I think we can do the work remote. But I think there's something about building a team culture that you sometimes need human interactions because we are social creatures and animals by nature. And I think we're going to be missing a little bit of that. And we might not see the effects or impact of that for quite some time to, and really understand or know how it, it materializes. I mean, I, I know at least from, from my perspective, before in the past, I didn't go into the office all the time, but I went enough where sometimes I would run into someone and we would have a quick chat. We would solve a problem in a five minute interaction walking down the hallway. Now, there's much more effort on pinging someone on, on a chat. Are you free? Can you chat for five minutes? Or trying to find a time slot in someone's calendar. And I, I find myself having to do more fifth, scheduling 15 minute meetings on someone's calendar now, just to quickly chat and talk about something versus just running them in the hallway or when I'm visiting a, 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 a site in, in, in Detroit or New York and running and someone talking. So I think longer term, we'll start to see what that actually accumulates into. I don't know what that is right now, but I think there will be something and, and we'll just have to see what it looks like, whether it's in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's material or not. Companies are going to start running private chat roulette servers just for their employees. <laughs> I can kind of see them coming in with a hybrid of like, we have an office that you can go in when you want, but it's not mandatory. Because mm -hmm. uh, we, we kind of toyed with the idea of having, like all of our employees absolutely love remote work, but mm -hmm. we toyed with the idea of what if we had an office that is like maybe like a lease or something that we can just like spring up whenever we need it and it's not used by us at the rest of the time. And then if we need to collaborate on a project in person, they were having like a, a hackathon or we're finalizing a product before it goes to market. We can all just kind of be brought together in this physical office and finish the product there and then go back to working remote. And that kind of, that fixes the yeah. problem of the, do we have complete social isolation or do we just have constant just office culture all day, every day? An office that's almost like a pop-up co-working space. Essentially. Yeah. That, that is what we suggested. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it also helps if there are some structured events as well to bring people, encourage people to come in as well. Um, I, I mean, at least in, in LA here, in, in, in my office, when, when we still went into the office, um, you know, when, when to encourage people to come in, we'd buy lunch for everyone. We'd spend, you know, eating lunch together. We'd spend 90 minutes to talk about just, just general updates from everyone. So that way everyone can share what's going on in their world. And that actually fosters follow-on conversations later in the day that help solve those problems and create those interactions. So I, I think it's going to be a combination of the remote work with some structured office time where there's some type of event to, to bring and build that culture. Um, I think that's going to be important. And, and also for some people, uh, 
they want to go into the office because like like New York City, they're going to be they're going to be they're living in like a a 100 square foot closet. They're going to want the space. <laughs> um, so I think it's going to really depend on on you know someone's living situation, their personal situation, whether they have a partner at home that's also working at home. Maybe they need that space. So I, I think having that optionality is going to be very important. And I think that's really what the workspace is going to look like. It's not one or the other, but that flexible arrangement for you know what works for your scenario situation. I agree with that. And I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that because I'm one of those people who I love to work at home. Like my current company is very happy to do that. But if I don't know, if, say they get bored out and I end up with another company who's like, hey, you have to work in the office constantly. I'm just not going to be able to be productive because I just don't, I don't work in those kind of environments. Has anyone on this call felt, let's find the right words here, Ca- I have had to censor myself out of respect for people who have been having a hard time during this lockdown. And I don't generally express openly just how giddily happy I am spending weeks and weeks at a time in my own house, never going out. Because there's like a lot of privilege attached to that, right? Like I get my milk and dairy delivered. We get veggies that we grow. Like we don't hate each other. I'm not under the roof with like an abusive relationship or something. But I, I just love, love being at home for weeks at a time. I don't know if anyone else has been enjoying this lockdown a lot or even yeah. if it's appropriate to be able to say that. I've, I've kind of avoided saying this on Twitter because a lot of people, especially extroverts, that they mm-hmm. just get depressed not having human contact for weeks on end. Yeah. But as an introvert myself, I'm absolutely loving like the isolation. <laughs> Introverts unite. And uh yeah, like I, ever since the lockdown started, I haven't really cared because I, I get my groceries delivered anyway, because mm-hmm. I'm lazy. Um, I'm used to staying at, I'm used to working from home. I've never ever in my life worked in an office. So right. this is just, it's my day to day life as I love it. And I just, I feel like I can't say that because people are like, they are going through kind of the worst time right now with this kind of forced lockdown. And then there's, of course, a subset of the population who are just like loving it. So. Everyone loves, or at least many people on this Zoom love like working at home. I actually do miss travel. I don't miss leaving my house, but I miss travel. Those sound like disjointed statements, but yeah, I miss just like pleasure travel, which sort of like would mostly, how many of us mostly like pleasure travel was really just work travel, but you stay like extra days. Um, I miss that. And that's weird. It's really weird to not be in airports right now. But if you could go like what, let's say a magic like mask exists that you can just travel freely as long as you're wearing this mask, it's guaranteed you're not going to get infected. And you could just get like, because all the airlines, if you do like Scotch cheap flights or anybody, they're just throwing like deals. Where would you go right now that you haven't been able to go? And none of us can go because we're all in America. Actually, I America can go. can't go fucking so anywhere. I actually have that optionality. So, uh, so I guess some people on Twitter know that I was supposed to move to Europe back back right. in March. And I actually moved in March, set up my apartment, did some business travel. I had a scheduled trip to come back to the U.S. to get my visa, my Schengen visa, so I could stay there long term. In the middle of all of this, this is when the pandemic really ramped up. So I'm literally stuck in Los Angeles and can't return to, to, my, to my apartment in, in Europe. Just this week, I got confirmation that I'm allowed to return. I just need to get one more document I need to submit to the consulate, and I'll be able to travel to the EU uh, and to basically resume my move to the EU. And what I have to do is once I uh, arrive, I need to take a COVID-19 test to show that I don't have the test. There's a specific list uh, of approved tests that I'm allowed to take. It's some ISO yeah. some antigen tests and, then, and and swabs at the same time. Yeah. If I have a confirmation and I don't have it, I don't have to quarantine or lock myself down because most of Europe is opening up now. Yeah. So I'm going to be free to travel within Europe. Uh, and, and my car is still there. My apartment is set up. So I'm going to be set. I'm going to get, I have the opportunity to escape this baloney that's happening in the States right now. I think I can travel. I I want to go to Hawaii. Like that's the the one place that I absolutely would love to go, because uh, I surf. So it's a it's a surfing place, and it's just a beautiful island. So uh, I want to 
probably travel across like as many of the Hawaiian islands as I can. Um, which I think technically I could do right now. I just don't want to because it's dangerous. Yeah, the um, I don't know if y'all know my my ex, Lady Merlin. We're you know from Tool, like she's still around. I'm still very good friends with her. She's from Hawaii. She lived there for years. So she and I used to go there for conferences back when the Shaka Khan was always out there. Uh, it's a beautiful place. I've always wanted to hit some of the neighbor islands that I haven't gotten to yet. But hell yeah, man, you almost look. Like you could, you could pass, you could, like, you don't look howly. You could almost pass, like, get up on the Forbidden maybe, Island. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm Tara and I are working on other ways of uh, travel and various things that'll eventually be a con talk. Some of you know about it, some of you don't, but it has to do with various uh, ancestral paperwork and, and freedom to move around more than American can. Because have you seen the map? the official map of like countries you're allowed to travel to if you're American right now. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, like, it's pretty, it's pretty small. That's why I, I, have, I, I none I, of those I, countries I, have their shit together. So like they're places yeah. you don't want to go anyway. I mean, I can't but, say I blame them because uh, like America has not really handled the spread too well. I think I looked at some of the, the graphs and the infection rate in pretty much all of Europe, even the UK is dropping consistently. And then you look at the American graph and it's just like a line straight up. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what happened was as soon as there was word, at least here in LA, as soon as there was word that the curve started to get flattened, everyone stopped following the rules. They stopped wearing masks, stopped social distancing. Uh, I, I I don't think it was just the rules because um they started like actually reopening things. It, they they started dropping the rules. I remember they reopened the beaches sometime in I think early June, and I happened to be cycling. I I cycled down the beach cycle path. And I happened to be cycling past the beach on the day they'd reopened it. it and I had packed. no idea they reopened it. Was completely yeah. packed. And I was looking over and it's like, there are more people than I've even seen on the 4th of July. Like there are millions of people packed on this beach. Like what is happening? Is there an event? So I go online, I looked it up and it's like, oh, of course, they've reopened the beaches. So everyone has scheduled their beach day for the exact first day it reopens. And I think that just kind of, that happened with every single reopening when they reopened restaurants, everyone went to restaurants and they just undid all of the work that the, the kind of rules had, uh, had done. Yeah. There was even like a news headline. I think it was in the New York times or wall street journal where it was about how California was almost like the beacon of hope. And then all of a sudden it went complete 180 yeah. because the cases <laughs> in LA were going up and then all the lockdowns and everything started to happen and the curve started to get flattened. And that was like a, almost a success story. And then complete opposite. Sorry to get now is like one of the what the highest rates um, in in the U.S. right now. Yeah, and I, I I remember kind of them saying there would be a second wave. Like we need to watch out for the second wave. And California was just like, nah, it'll nah. be fine. <laughs> all good. <laughs> We're just gonna have all one wave. So so with all this like COVID stuff obviously happening and getting worse. I mean, I think just looking at the economy, it's been a little strange. The the recovery. Um, I don't think it's going to last. I, I think this is just the, 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 the buildup before something really big happens um, the other way. So um, I don't know. It just seems like a bubble forming right now. Yeah, I agree on the bubble front. I've been kind of like, I, I guess most of you guys don't know, but I, I've been trading stock for about a decade now. And um, I've been watching the market through this and it kind of, it took a huge, just it dropped off a cliff the second COVID started. And then everyone just forgot about it. They were like, okay, the worst has happened. Let's just put our, let's buy our stocks back. And of course, then it was like record unemployment. Companies are going bankrupt left and right. And they're just still like buying back stock. And because there's so little liquidity, the stocks are actually going higher than they were in a, at the, before COVID at the peak of the US market. And even now, like NASDAQ is making all time highs every single day. And it's just like people have kind of become like disassociated from this kind of this pandemic. Yeah. And they're just speculating on the like what they think the stock market is going to do. Because, of course, all of the uh, all of the major traders are out of the market now. They're waiting to see what is going to happen next. So you have no real kind of serious traders moving the market. You just have a bunch of uh, like kind of mom and pop traders, kids with their savings, just uh, essentially just yeeting money into stocks 
and uh, like and no one really knows what they're doing so the market has completely detached from any form of reality also with the the stimulus checks i mean people have money so they're surviving and making do or investing it as as you say but i think the stimulus checks are going into this, they're going into stock 100% that's where most of them are going. Well, I, mean, I, I think it's also keeping, it's boosting the economy a little bit. Eventually, the, those stimulus checks are going to run out. People are going to use up that money or there aren't going to be more checks. And then you're going to run into a cliff. Uh, so and that's what I've seen. And so I, I really don't know. I, I think the effects of it are, we're going to see it coming. It may take right. a couple months. It may wait until 2021. But I, don't, I, I personally think something big is going to happen. I just don't think the stimulus checks are big enough to kind of to cancel out the uh, the decline in economic activity. I think it's like kind of a, a drop in the bucket, but but just the way in which those stimulus checks are being spent makes it seem as if the economy is doing a lot better. Like I've I'm pretty sure a lot of because uh, these stimulus checks went out to anyone who paid tax, so that's a lot of kind of students who are who are like working at kind of low end jobs. And they're just like, I've just got a huge amount of money. What do I do with it? Obviously, I invest it. So a lot of those stimulus checks are probably going into stocks, which is inflating the expectations of the market. Whereas in reality, the actual, the stimulus checks, like the all of the stimulus checks that were issued don't even make up a day of like US kind of economic activity. Yeah, speaking of the, the checks going to people um, like students, I mean, another funny scenario, I'd even think about the, the criteria in which how you get a check. It's funny and I understand because the, the logistics of trying to create all this criteria of who gets and who doesn't is very difficult. So essentially it's about anyone who paid taxes. When you think about it, there's a subset of people who are green card holders who live and work overseas, but file U.S. taxes, and they live in a country that where they're not making a lot of money because that's a lot of money in that country. They're getting stimulus checks because they pay taxes and their income was under a certain threshold. So they're getting money, even though they don't really live in America. <laughs> I tried to file for all that stuff and it rejected me because it couldn't understand. Like, because, you know, core group is based in other states, but I live here. And we pay all our taxes everywhere, but it basically the Fed was like, "No, you, we don't. We're not sure you exist." Which I'm fine with the Fed not knowing I exist or where I live, <laughs> but it did it did mean I couldn't file for anything. Thankfully, we got the our company got the payroll protection money, so we're we're actually just doing you know paychecks for ourselves right now. Uh, but yeah, it's it's crazy freaking times, man. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's definitely gonna be interesting to see what what happens, and, and 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 it's interesting to see how different large enterprises have taken different approaches to this as well. I mean, I, I know there's a movement for some large enterprises to basically guarantee employment for their employees for as long as possible, because there's the belief that you know, but to to help keep our economy going, to keep things healthy, but also to keep the morale of the organization as we go through this bump going, is we have to provide some offer some kind of assurances and stability and security for people. So people don't worry about that piece of their life. They can focus on the things like improving their skills, getting ready for the for the new economy that's coming when, when things open up and the economy opens up again, while other organizations are looking at, you know, the, 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 the routine cost kind of, hey, let's start doing layoffs or let's start cutting pay or whatever it may be. So I, I think it's been interesting to see um, how different companies have taken different approaches on this. Segwaying on from uh, that, there's um, there's Hertz, which uh, I found to be a very interesting one. They um, they essentially filed for bankruptcy, and uh, their stock skyrocketed in the fo- in the days following the uh, announcement of the bankruptcy. And uh, I think it came from this belief that uh, kind of coronavirus will go away, the company will recover, and somehow the stock price is money for the company, and that by investing in the stocks, you're giving the company money, which is not how that works. Um, and they kind of ended up thinking this company is going to be saved by buying into the stock of a company that has was one of the first to be bankrupted by coronavirus. Well, a lot of people do not have an understanding of what bankruptcy is and how it like it doesn't mean that a company goes away. It's not like an individual who runs out of money. It's, it's a restructuring. Uh, which is honestly why I loved. There was somebody. It was like on CNBC, 
and they were talking about, you know, should big companies get loans for blah, blah, blah. I think it was like airlines, but it could apply to any company. And, you know, this, the, this pundit who was on and the, the, the host was like, just slack jawed because he was like, so a bunch of freaking companies go bankrupt. Who cares? Who cares? It's a bunch of multi-billionaire investors that don't get their quarterly earnings payout. Who cares? The company doesn't go away. It restructures. The employees wind up owning more of the company. He's like, I don't give a God. And like the, the host had no idea how to approach this guest. But he was laying some freaking truth down about how bankruptcy works for big companies. And I'm, it doesn't surprise me that the stock went through the roof because a bunch of investors were like, cool, a bunch of debt's going to get canceled out. And cars, cars are durable goods. Like they're, the cars are still going to be in the Hertz fleet. But they're depreciating assets as well. So Exactly. It's just a win-win for greedy investors. I mean, is it though? Because like, well, yes, companies that file for bankruptcy, they don't cease business. Usually it's the, uh, the I believe the chapter 11 restructuring. The thing is, the in terms of creditors, the debt, they go down a list of like, whose debts are paid off first. It's like, uh, I think management, lawyers, contractors, and then right at the very, very bottom of that list is the shareholders. They are the least likely in the company to get their money back. And this idea that the company is like billions and billions of dollars in debt, and they're suddenly going to find billions of dollars enough to A, become solvent again, and B, pay off their shareholders is just insane. Yeah, and like those people are the shareholders. They're, they're eating their money into the stock like we're going to get rich from this. And the reality is that they are going to be the, yeah, they're going to be the last to be paid. We keep all our money in Vanguard index funds. That's all we do. We don't play the market. We, we don't have the mind for it, the sharpness of brain. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I do either. <laughs> I found myself just baffled with what's going on lately. Yeah, it's it's all a mystery. I, I I do something so I put them in into funds or or ETFs, so I don't have to do a lot of work. I mean, just just diversify. Yeah. I mean, speaking of, uh, I mean, with the you know everything has been going on with with the pandemic. Uh, I mean, what what has everyone been kind of been keeping them busy themselves busy with uh, being quarantined and at home? I mean, I, it seems like that all three of us are may, are naturally kind of happy to be home uh, or it's not a huge change because we stay at home most of the time anyways but what have you guys been doing besides um i guess just hanging out at home there's an episode of family guy where peter gets pulled over and it's a joke about drunk driving and he try he gets asked to step out of the car and it's just this deafening cacophony of rattling glass as he's stepping through his car um I would say that's the sound of me walking through the living room. That's that's what I've been doing during the lockdown. Um, I don't even know what I've been doing. I think I just carried on with work. Um, I've been doing like a little bit of kind of pro bono work. I don't know if it's even called that if you're not a lawyer, but um, yeah, I've just been I've been doing some uh, some security work for kind of just like the greater good kind of things on the. Uh, on the side of my day job because there hasn't been a lot of work right now because with uh with the pandemic security spending obviously gets cut so there's less clients there's less for us to do so um yeah i've just been kind of finding side jobs to do to keep me busy yeah i've I, it's pretty much some of the tech it's been more of the same um uh, i mean what i did find ended up happening was i work even more because i don't have to commute into the office at all and then also because I'm 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 supposed to be in Europe right now, so I've been working weird hours as well. So I'm waking up pretty much at like three a.m. or four a.m. Uh, and then I'm working until like six p.m. So <laughs> I think it's just been a lot more work. But in terms of hobbies, it's been the same. Whether you know, it's motorcycling, wrenching on cars, or cooking. So um, yeah, it hasn't been a huge change outside of just I feel like I'm I'm working even more now. We've been camping a lot more. Because it's a safe thing to do, you know. Yeah, here in LA, the parks are completely packed. I mean, I I live right next to a park, and the park is packed all the time. So I just don't go anymore um, because there's nothing to do. Everything is closed, so people are going to the beach when they're not supposed to, and people are congregating in the park when they're not supposed to. So um, 
yeah, that, that's kind of my observation here in California. Now, going back to the point we talked about earlier, no one's following the rules and things are getting crazy. You said cooking. Has anyone acquired new cooking hardware of any kind? And if so, is it impressive or busted bullshit? I think I got a coffee machine. That's the closest I can get to cooking. No new equipment, but I've been using the equipment more. So, um, Stephen, as you as you know, I have a wide assortment of cast iron. So I've been using the cast iron more and more, and I'm loving it more because obviously, the more you use it, the better it is. Oh yeah. So it's been I've been spending a lot more effort into making breakfast, uh, whether it is bacon and eggs or shashuka or whatever it may be. It's it's cast iron, baby, all the way. Um, so definitely, cast iron has gotten good use. I've also started to use my AeroPress a lot more because I got an espresso attachment for it. Yeah. So it makes a pretty good espresso. It's not the same as a, like a thousand dollar machine, but um, it's it's acceptable. So I've been making a lot of lattes and other random things. So it's it's been it's been it's been good. Just using more my equipment even more. I was gonna say Tara's espresso machine had to go get a repair for a couple of weeks. That was a scary couple of weeks that she didn't know <laughs> what to do. By the way, does, how many people have an instant pot? A what? Oh my god! I, I have a, I have a, I have a rice cooker. That's that's about it. Oh Jesus! You got to get on that instant pot bandwagon. I bought mine because I heard you could make prison wine in it, and you can. But um, <laughs> in addition to that, we make yogurt and a lot of other things. But instant pot, there's a new lid that you can put on it that is it's called an air fryer. I mean, like I've heard of air frying. I don't know how you fry with no oil. I don't know what that is. Mm. I don't know. I'm gonna try air frying on an instant. I've been meaning to try it. it. Like I, I've been getting adverts for air fryers, and I'm I'm like, well, I guess like I should probably try this. It's like a, it's a hype now, and I I honestly I don't get it either. Like how how are you frying without oil? Get the I, instant I, pot, man. Make yourself some yogurt and or prison wine. Yeah, I, I feel like there's all these kitchen gadgets I want to get, but I have limited space in my kitchen, so I don't want to like go crazy because there's this toaster oven. This Japanese toaster oven that I, I that I, I've seen uh, like these reviews for, it's like a three hundred dollar toaster oven where you can toast one slice of bread at a time. <laughs> but it it does it basically it's like a almost like a pressurized toaster oven steam, so that way the bread doesn't get dried out because it's pressurized. But it's creating a, a lot of heat on both sides of the bread, so it's actually really crispy on the outside and brown but still very soft and moist and chewy on the inside. Um, so I, I, I've been kind of like eyeing getting one. Uh, it's something I may splurge on once I'm, once I'm back from Europe, but it's, uh, it's, it's very tempting to get. I'm going to be interested to try your, uh, your, your gourmet toast. Yes, <laughs> my $300 toaster oven. Uh, <laughs> toast that. The bougiest thing I've heard of. That's amazing. I know I want to try it. I looked at toaster ovens on eBay for the most busted $20 worthless toaster oven because I wanted to Cerakote some gun parts, and that's about it. <laughs> a requested topic from our viewers is the anonymous DDoS attack, well, the anonym, anonymous reported DDoS attack on the US that uh, essentially didn't exist. It never happened. So um, for those of you who don't know, there was um, there was a big sell outage, I believe, T-Mobile. Uh, had a carrier outage, which meant that no data or uh, SMS messages were getting through their network. And quite a few of the US carriers uh, used T-Mobile's network. So it kind of led to a knock-on effect where a bunch of different uh, phone users had no internet and a normal uh, kind of wide cable internet was fine. But phone, uh, there was like a good three, four hour period where phone internet just went out. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, at this time, Anonymous tweeted a screenshot of, I believe, uh, one of the DDoS mitigations firms like Pew Pew Maps that shows DDoS attacks mm -hmm. that, that doesn't really show anything. And they said, uh, look, a big, big DDoS attack is happening against the US. And they uh, attributed this, uh, this network outage to being a DDoS attack by a hostile foreign nation, which... Turns out to not be the case. There was no DDoS attack. No one who's in any position to monitor network traffic reported any anything out of the ordinary. But uh, it got so quickly out of control that 
a US a sitting US congressman was tweeting about it um and making policy comments on this and uh it made it across all of the US news it was trending on Twitter Facebook mm-hmm. and there was just this huge spectacle uh, uh, spectacle about this attack that never actually happened so basically fake news essentially yes actual fake news where do people turn nowadays when you think a major service is down? I feel like Twitter is the answer. Well, at least because we're all in InfoSec and everyone in InfoSec's on Twitter. But like, if Twitter's down, what do you do? Do you go to like private slacks and ask people? So, uh, there's, a, there's a service called Down Detector, which is quite popular. But the way in which it works is it just scrapes Twitter and Facebook and Instagram for reports of sites being down which is actually what fueled this speculation because everyone was reporting that they couldn't access, say, Google, Facebook, you name it, because obviously their internet is offline. And then it was scraping the reports. And then it was announcing Twitter is down, Facebook is down. And of course, they're not. It's just users are reporting that their network is essentially offline. So uh, Down Detector is like is definitely enough users that it was able to help fuel this kind of speculation of a DDoS attack. Well, from an enterprise standpoint, there's, there's, there are services you can subscribe to that monitor. I guess I don't know how Down Detector works, but it monitors the major ISPs and their connections. Uh, and it gives you an idea is if you're getting a, all of a sudden an influx of users calling in, is it an issue on their side with their ISP? Or is it an issue with your links to your data center or something that's leveraged by your cloud providers, or your service providers? It helps you kind of figure that out a little, a little easily. Uh, with actual data and not just speculation from people ra- raging on uh, on Twitter. Well, yeah, so I actually have access to one of these services. So the first thing I did was like, are there actual connectivity issues to Facebook, Google, you name it? And the answer was no. And then I checked some of the big cloud providers like Cloudflare. They monitor a huge portion of internet traffic and they're seeing nothing. There's nothing on any of the BGP network feeds. And I tweeted, hey, like this, this isn't, this isn't like nothing is happening. It's just an outage. And at that point, I had all these kind of like 12 year old anonymous fanboys like, you don't know anything. How can you possibly know what you're talking about? What services do you even have access to? And it's like, well, I mean, I can monitor all of the network traffic for all of the world. Um, but other than that, nothing. Now, no, no, Tech, are these those same fanboys that several years ago? downloaded that low orbit ion cannon tool and just got themselves hacked instead of actually running a ddos attack i imagine it would have been um yeah the uh lawyer kids uh that's been a, a thing since man as long as i remember of anonymous is their their trademark lawyer and uh i guess at some point someone distributed an infected copy which a bunch of them all of course ran making themselves into rather than an opt-in botnet an actual botnet awesome well i know that if there's ever a major outage and twitter and slack are both down at the same time i'm not going to go know like what to do so i'm going to try to hit you both up on signal if that doesn't work i'm going to start loading rifles while tara's firing up a ham radio <laughs> i mean if enough stuff is down i will just go back to bed like if there's no twitter like what's the point of being awake what are, what are you going to do? Dude, have you ever been in bed like and not able to sleep so much that you scroll and actually reach the end of Twitter, your current? And I'm like, oh, what do I what do? I, do? I don't know what to do. <laughs> I breaks my brain. I'm always perpetually either a thousand tweets behind or current, and I don't know what the fuck to do in either circumstance. I don't think I've ever reached the bottom of my Twitter. I just, I think I follow so many people that I could, I could scroll just on today's feed. I could just scroll for weeks on end. I can't say that's ever happened, but I've gotten close to uh, on, on Reddit, just scrolling where there's so much cached up, I guess, above that my, my phone starts to slow down. <laughs> right, so I, I think that's a good uh, place to end our first pilot yeah. podcast episode. Thank you all so much. Thank you for like inviting me in. This was this was the bang, man. Hell yeah. Yeah, thanks for joining. We'll do, get to do this again soon. Yeah, and uh, I think we'll try and make it a regular thing.